Welcome to the reading of tributes of the American Academy of Arts and Letters. I'm the president of the Academy, uh, Kwame Anthony Appiah. Since uh, 1903, the Academy has presented tributes to members who've died, and we continue that tradition tonight with tributes to two artists, one composer, and two writers. It's our custom, out of respect for the deceased, not to um, applaud the reading of the tributes, uh, even though I am confident they will be excellent and worthy of uh, your respectful applause. So we begin with the tribute to Varjan Bogosian, which will be read by Paul Rasika. Varjan Bogosian, a member of the American Academy since 1986, died on September 21st. It was 2000. What year was it? It's three years ago. Yeah. He lived in Hanover, New Hampshire, where he taught at Dartmouth until his retirement. Hanover, if you know it, it has, has two notable works of art, the great Orozco murals, ending with the stillbirth of education, and in the Baker Library, an enormous bronze door uh, festooned with bronze doves that Boghossian made in Rome and gave to Dartmouth. Boghossian's first love was poetry. He could recite at length from Frost, Hausmann, many things. He was four years in the Navy as a, as a bread baker on a battleship. Uh, after his discharge, he attended the Vesper George School in Boston. Later, a uh, little later, Joseph Albers at Yale saw quality in what he made, though he was not really a painter or a sculptor. Bogosian was the heir to Kurt Schwitters, the originator of collage. As Bogosian always said, he did not make things, he found them and put them together. He was an avid beachcomber and was known to every junk or antique shop in New England. What Varjan had was a perfect eye. Bogosian was born in New Britain, Connecticut in 1926. He grew up poor. His father and mother, refugees of the Turkish-Armenian massacre of 1918, worked in factories in that town. Varjan of, often sang in Armenian a song it went something like this, Suda, 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 Arme Pansore. I always asked him what it meant. He said it meant nothing, nothing, nothing. Everything is nothing. Anyhow, that was his great song. This is a story from his childhood. A visitor comes to the house. The boy, Varjan, is sent to the kitchen for a glass of water. Let the faucet run until it's cold then put the glass in a saucer and bring it to the guest. I read this once to someone who had no idea why, he, why these people said let the water run. If you never lived in a cold world of flats, you probably don't know that. Yeah, it doesn't get cold until it runs. I first met Varjan in 1972 when I went to Dartmouth as a visiting artist. I was expected to give a lecture, but Bogosian told me the attendance was never very good. I had once heard Robert Graves give a talk downtown. It was, what do centaurs eat? And the place was packed. And so uh, uh, Bogosian and I concocted the subject, what do artists eat? And we put posters up all around the town all over Hanover, but still hardly anyone came, just the five faculties, not even Bogosian. <laughs> the, the mercurial Bogosian loved Rome. He was twice in residence at the American Academy, and one year we traveled together with our wives, Marilyn and Blair, to Rome. He suggested that I bring a, a Renzo Vespignani drawing that I'd bought for a couple of hundred dollars in Provincetown. When we, uh, when we got off the plane, we left our wives and went straight to the Via Marguta and sold that drawing for $3,000. Uh, 
Uh, Vespignani was very hot then, but now I don't think he's known at all. It paid for a whole Roman trip to Rocca di Papa, Frascati, Villa d'Este, everything like that. For years, Bogosian would arrive at my studio on the Cape with a collage that he was working on. It was always in the trunk of his car. He'd open the trunk and you'd see, he'd be coming from Hanover to Provincetown, and you'd see all these things he was working on. Uh, he'd bring it into my studio and I'd add something to it. He would do something else, and then he'd sell it for cash in Provincetown. Bogosian never had a credit card. Now, collage never meant anything to me. I've been a painter all my life. Still, for 30 years, we collaborated in this way. How is it possible, I asked myself, that such entirely different artists could do so? What luck to have such a friend as Varjan. Tribute to Martin Boykin will be read by David Rakowski. Martin Boykin was the most complete musician I've ever known, <clears throat> and I'm proud to say I was his friend and colleague. Marty's knowledge of music literature was encyclopedic. His piano chops, even for sight reading, were epic, and his music was expressive, complex, and lyrical. A colleague of ours at Brandeis put it this way, Marty's forgotten more music than I'll ever know. Marty grew up in the New York City area and studied music with private teachers from an early age, and that included piano lessons with Edward Storyman, the ultimate interpreter of Schoenberg's piano music. The New York Times archive has two reviews of recitals uh, Marty gave at Times Hall from when he was a teenager. The reviews were positive and glowing. The recital he gave at age 16 had standard repertoire, including Scarlatti, Mozart, Schubert, and Chopin. And the recital at age 18 had Beethoven, Bartok, and the five piano pieces, Opus 23, by Schoenberg. A daring choice in 1949 for one so young. The music and, oh, oh yes. The, Opus 23 piano pieces contain Schoenberg's first 12-tone music, and several times Marty brought up that piece with me, commenting wisely that the non-12-tone music in that set was crabbed and self-referential, while the 12-tone music was full of breathing and life. It opened up new vistas for Schoenberg. Oh yes, and it was a performance by a living composer. Marty studied at Harvard and Yale and pursued a career as a pianist. Indeed, he was the Boston Symphony's staff pianist for a time, and he appeared on a TV series narrated by Copeland as the pianist in a performance of Piero Lunaire. He was hired at Brandeis University in the late 1950s as a performer and the organizer of musical performances, including the Brandeis Chamber Players. During that time, he also pursued composition more seriously, eventually becoming a full-time composer with piano chops to burn. He was well known and much performed in the Boston area, and he went to just about every new music event in town. I don't think I was ever at a new music event in Boston that Marty didn't go to, though we only exchanged pleasantries. <clears throat> In the late 80s, I got a job in California and went to an ear play concert in San Francisco. On that concert, I heard a glistening performance by Eric Moe of Marty's Fantasy Sonata for Piano. It was wonderful, finely worked details exploding into the most beautiful phrases and so much variety in the piano writing. I immediately wrote to Marty, reintroducing myself, and gushed about how much I loved that piece. I got so gushy, I even wrote, the piece caressed its intervals. We started a regular correspondence soon after, often sending scores and recordings of new pieces and jokes, and no gossip. Soon thereafter, he assigned a song of mine as an analysis piece for the PhD general examinations at Brandeis, and I was tickled to see what graduate students found in my music. And once he and his wife, Susan Schwalb, came to visit us when we moved to the Worcester Mass area, where we canoed on a lake, and this is probably well, actually, probably definitely the first time Marty had ever held a canoe paddle. 
I became Marty's colleague at Brandeis in 1996, where I got to witness his absolute devotion to students and his common sense approach to musical analysis. In PhD oral examinations in particular, it was common to sit through a student's analysis of a thorny piece and see their points all get tied in knots. Then Marty would step in and ask one simple question that completely changed the trajectory and opened up other ways of thinking about the music. Indeed, my colleagues agree with me that we all learned more about music sitting in those exams with Marty than we did in eight years of school. I was particularly happy to read the two books he wrote during this time, which made beautiful and complex examinations of pieces with common sense premises. A few more things. Of course, we all did graduate admissions together, and pre-MIDI, it was breathtaking to see Marty taking an applicant's score of an unperformed orchestra piece and playing it perfectly at the piano. It was equally breathtaking to hear his orchestra music for the first time then, as it was economically and beautifully written. Oh yes, he also nominated me for membership in the American Academy of Arts and Letters. I wonder how that turned out. <laughs> to conclude, Every musician, whether a composer, scholar, or performer, who encountered Marty became a better and smarter musician because of it. I include myself in that group. The tribute to Christo will be read by Kate Levin. In paying tribute to Christo this evening, I will also be doing the same for his partner, Jean-Claude because while Christo was usually singled out as the artist, his art was their art from the time they met in 1958. They like to point out that they were born on the same day, June 13th, 1935, but the connection was far more fundamental. That was certainly my experience in working with them, and it showed in the work they produced. All art is in some sense a conversation, but for Christo and Jean-Claude, their elemental communing gave their projects the exceptional force and demand and reward of a dialogue with the viewer. Their early pieces set off an exchange between materials, the everyday, the juxtaposed, a wrapped parcel, an alleyway full of steel barrels. They provided no impediments to engaging with the work, no intimidating materials, no distancing through the unfamiliar. Instead, the work was an expansive invitation to look at form, at space, and to feel the work without needing to touch it because we all know what brown paper and string feel like. By means of something slightly whimsically estranged, a bridge, but wrapped, Christo and Jean-Claude offered us the chance to greet something we thought we knew, now as a newly enhanced, briefly even enchanted partner. The projects, the major works to which Christo and Jean-Claude devoted years and sometimes decades, were themselves made up of conversations, quite literally. Meetings with government officials, public hearings, community presentations, environmental impact studies. Getting permits, hiring cranes, training installation teams, buying fabric by the ton. The artists insisted that these were essential parts of the work alongside the more traditional manifestations of art the magnificent drawings and collages, Christo said, were the only things he made by himself. The artists also found a way to make time itself a material part of the work. Each of the major projects took years to gestate and then were installed for a limited number of days. Those limits were deliberate, on purpose, as part of the work's provocation, as part of the urgency around its impact. The formal names of the projects included the years in the making, but you had to hustle to see them. As Jean-Claude loved to say, once in a lifetime, once upon a time. And you had to think about the role of permanence in the dynamic of creative value. I remember as a teenager seeing the Maisley Brothers documentary about Running Fence, the 24 mile installation in Northern California that was up for two weeks in 1976. In one of the 17 public hearings that took place over the four years of that project, questions come thick and fast about how something that lasts for such a short time could possibly be art. Finally, a woman stands up and says that she makes meals every day for her family. They eat quickly and return to farming. But just because they eat fast doesn't mean that food isn't essential 
or made with skill and care. Duration is not significant. Art does not come in a fixed ratio to time, but rather in conversation across variables of love and vision and memory. I just want to reiterate that as a teenager who saw that movie, I still remember the public hearing part, which was clearly part of Jean-Claude and Christo's conspiracy to make me a government bureaucrat. <laughs> For those two artists, making the work was the work. And that postulate annoyed some art critics who found the conversion narrative of winning over skeptical natives to be condescending. I think it also irked folks who think in abstractions that Jean-Claude and Christo were so diligent, not to say relentless and obsessive, in actually doing the work of community building, of centering the public in public art. I had the privilege of working with them closely on the gates in Central Park, a piece first proposed in 1979 and installed from February 12th to 27 in 2005. The intervening years were part of the exhibition, as far as the artists were concerned, and certainly the evolution of the gates from the initial concept to execution reflected an intense counterpoint over everything from time of year and depth of footings to how saffron, the color of the gates themselves, is not and never will be orange. The interplay of what could change and what could not, I do not recall the word compromise coming up, was an active, present component of the piece. After Jean-Claude's death in 2009, Christo finished two more of their projects, the floating piers on Lake Iseo in 2016 and the London Mastaba in 2018. Christo would have been present for L'Arc de Triomphe wrapped in Paris if the opening had not changed due to COVID. His devoted team completed it in 2021, following his death on May 31st, 2020. And the team continues to work on Christo and Jean-Claude's final project, a permanent mastaba in Abu Dhabi. So this is, a work of body, uh, this is a body of work that is not yet complete. But the impact grows. I believe that when the history of 21st century New York is told, the gates will be recognized as the moment when the city pivoted from the devastation of 9-11 into a renewed future. That four million people would spend 16 days strolling through 23 miles of Central Park in the dead of winter, reaffirm both the idea and the reality of New York as a collaboration among aspiration, frustration, ferocity, and reinvention, and beauty. Thank you. The tribute to Alison Lurie will be read by Laurie Moore. Alison Lurie taught at Cornell in the quasi-golden days of teaching creative writing. No syllabi, no craft talks, no requirement of relatable characters or admirable protagonists, no disputes about which is the greatest work of British literature, Harry Potter 1 or Harry Potter 4. That's really what the students want to talk about. Um, and no subsequent Twitter cancellations of the author. Narrative artists were called writers, not creatives or content providers. Also, no teaching in masks or on Zoom. In the golden age of workshops, the teacher needed only to be a presence and an eminence, only. Allison, of course, was just such a presence and eminence. She sometimes sketched or knitted all the way through the evening graduate workshop discussion held in her living room, but not a single word got past her. And when something seemed worth commenting on, she piped up and commented. She was not Madame Defarge. There was no suppressed hostility. There was only a gentle sort of humming. Afterwards, she would take the student author into her dining room and give them her own take on things, along with an extra cup of wine. Sometimes, as with me, she would say, don't pay attention to anything any of them just said. <laughs> and a tough skin, sort of, began to grow. She had her own green thumb in this self-growing of a tough skin and sometimes shared tales of it. Mostly, she encouraged her students. It is one of the things a writer needs most, and she knew that. Allison embodied a magnetic presence in a sly and oblique way. She was a blend of Athena, Greta Garbo, and Mother Goose. 
one would sometimes see her shopping in Ithaca's college town or the farmer's market with her brisk, intent pace, her wide straw hats, a basket on her arm for purchases. In September, when the students reconvened for classes, she liked to hand out tomatoes from her garden, since she had a green thumb in this way as well, and always had extra produce. She was the only person I ever saw bite into a tomato as if it were an apple. And it did not spill or spurt or drip because, it seemed, she understood the tomato. That one could understand a tomato so well seemed less like culinary expertise than like sorcery. But I knew it came about from her famously sympathetic listening, even if it was listening to a tomato. Being interested in its obscure stories from the vine was surely a courtesy before finally picking it up and bearing down. And though eating a tomato in this way may seem an odd detail, to me it expressed something both naturally innocent, skillfully practical, and deeply experienced about Allison. She could seem shy, yet she wasn't. She showed up at, par up at parties, even one of mine, there was a knock on the door of my student apartment, student apartment, and there she was. She was always listening and afterward would sometimes just judiciously shake her head or else say something funny or bold. Her solidarity with women, her twinkle around charming men, her enchantment by and identification with children, all these were an aspect of the deepest part of her. She had a critical eye for vanity and meretricious affluence and valued simple living that also held a bit of glamour and amusement. She was also an early adopter of technology, of critical theory, of newfangled astrology, she was one of the only people I knew of in 1980 who already had a personal computer. Also that year, she signed up to audit Jonathan Culler's class on structuralism and post-structuralism to see what she needed to know. And once years later, when I was visiting Ithaca, she brought me to her house for lunch, which allowed me, as she pulled her car into it, a glimpse of her garage in it were perfectly stacked, perfectly labeled storage boxes, neatly arranged on the shelves. They seemed towering, tower, towering and fantastically organized. I said, Allison, look how organized you are with all these boxes. Yeah, she said with a sigh, I'm a Virgo. That's just the way Virgos are. Her work will endure the perfect narrative structure of her novels, the easy conversational voice of her essays, her belief that contradiction should appear often in storytelling, that perhaps it was the very key to authenticity. Her book on the language of clothes and of houses were of course a novelist's take, and her commitment to social realism extended even to tutorials with students where she might say something like, does this character have to stab her husband so expertly? Couldn't she flub it a little? Or would this character really wear dotted Swiss? Or can one really speak of an insect the size of a dot of dotted Swiss? She felt correctly that a fiction writer must check in truthfully with the material and psychological world, deep caves paid, paved with kitchen linoleum, to quote Allison quoting Alice Munro. Her husband, Edward, has mentioned her visits with him to his classes at Auburn Prison. She was a big hit there, he said, talking about her best-selling The Language of Clothes. The students were fascinated by semiotics and clothes and told her all about the little alterations they made in their uniforms to signal who they were tough guys, leaders, intellectuals, gay, etc. They just loved her, he said. The affection of her students is one of the many things she has left behind, perhaps especially for some of her women students who imagined they were like daughters, for she had a great sense of paying it forward. And she passed that along to us, as well as a sense that teaching should be pleasant. She really liked to teach. 
One cannot write all the time, she once said to me, when I was hoping to do just that. When as a grad student, I asked her whether she would be my thesis advisor, she replied, I would be honored. I was 23 years old. No one had ever said anything like that to me before, ever. It was such a stunning phrase to me, beautiful and moving, and I try to remember to use it myself with my own students when they make such burdensome requests, which Allison never treated as burdensome at all. In photos of her when she was young, Allison often has a sexy, wised up expression. She is looking at the camera as if to laughingly say, really? Allison was fun, which is one of the most important things one can be in life. And who won't miss her astuteness and wide smile and gameness for just about anything? Not anyone who knew her. When a writer dies, they are at first kept alive by the commentary and anecdotes of their friends, but ultimately they are kept alive by their own words. Charles Finch recently wrote in the New York Times, at any moment on our planet, there are at most a few dozen novelists working with great power for a broad audience with the material of consciousness, which is what the novel is so uniquely good at handling how it feels to be inside us, what it means, the devastations and beauties it brings. To lose one of these great writers before they begin their eternity in their own pages, I suppose, is just a pause. The tribute to Janet Malcolm will be read by Louis Begley. Janet Malcolm, a great writer, Stunningly prolific and versatile, died of lung cancer on June 18, 2021. She was elected to the Academy in 2001. In 2017, we awarded her the gold medal for Belles Lettres and Criticism. <laughs> Janet was born as Jana Clara Vienerova in 1935 in Prague, then the capital of Czechoslovakia into a well-to-do, assimilated Jewish family. Her father was a psychiatrist, her mother a lawyer. She had a younger sister, Marie, who survives her. Foreseeing the dangers that lay ahead for Jews, the parents converted to Lutheranism as a first line of defense and then managed to bribe Nazi officials for an exit visa that enabled them to travel by train to Hamburg and from there to New York on one of the last civilian ships to leave Europe for America before the outbreak of World War II. Once in New York City, the parents changed the family's name to Wynne, a step toward Americanization and as a protection against anti-Semitism taken at the time by many Jewish refugees from Europe. While Dr. Wynne studied for medical board examinations, the family lived with relatives in the Flatbush section of Brooklyn. Once he had died, once he had passed the examinations in 1940 and was able to practice medicine in the state of New York, they moved to the York Yorkville neighborhood on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, <coughs> home to a large Czech community that would provide Dr. Wynne with a devoted clientele. Neither Janet nor Marie knew English when the family arrived in the city. They learned quickly. In due course, Janet would attend the, school of, the High School of Music and Art on Manhattan's West Side, and the University of Michigan. As managing editor of its humor magazine, Gargoyle, she produced, among other works, a parody of The New Yorker. She also met there later married a fellow student, Donald Malcolm, the father of Anne Malcolm, Janet's only child. The couple eventually moved to New York, where Donald, a brilliant theater critic and book reviewer, went to work for The New Yorker. 
He died tragically and all too soon in 1975 <coughs> of a devastating illness that was never satisfactorily diagnosed. Janet became a regular contributor to the magazine in 1966. Having been separated from Donald for a number of years, she married in 1975 Gardner Botsford. Her editor at the magazine, whose first wife had died a year earlier. <coughs> Janet and Gardner's marriage was a model of conjugal felicity and professional cooperation. The rest is literary history. I've been reading Janet's articles and books seemingly forever, and certainly since 1978, when her astonishing one-way mirror taught me more about family therapy and much that I, that I wanted to know and much that I did want to know about psychoanalysis. The education was continued with the New Yorker pieces that became her book, The Impossible Profession. But I became fa her fascinated reader much earlier, in 1963, when I read in The New Yorker her beautiful short poem, Thoughts on Living in a Shaker House. Astonishingly, the short poem revealed to me the essential qualities that distinguish Janet's oeuvre. Her ability to, do, to evoke settings with eerie precision, her gift for ferreting out secrets, her mastery of the English language. Janet was not capable of writing a bad sentence. Her intelligence. It was all there, including, I venture to say, the promise of Janet's creation of new literary forms in her hands, biographical studies and reportage have been transformed into novels. One is tempted to say Russian novels. Everybody has Malcolm favorites. I will mention mine. In addition to The Impossible Profession, surely The Silent Woman, the haunting biography of Sylvia Platt and Ted Hughes, Two Lives, Gertrude and Alice, which investigates and relentlessly and yet sympathetically humanizes the Gertrude Stein and Alice B. Toklas couple. <coughs> in the book that I now like the best of all, Janet's Iphigenia in Forest Hills, Anatomy of a Murder Trial. It would have been difficult to imagine Janet's making her way into a tightly knit Queens community of Bukharan immigrant Jews to inquire into the murder trial of Mazeltov Bukurova, a 35 doctor accused of arranging for the murder of her estranged dentist husband. The case had all the elements of a whodunit, which Janet unraveled with her trademark precision. In the end, she drew no conclusion as to guilt or innocence. But her fellow feeling with the mother is undeniable and led her subsequently to support unsuccessful efforts to obtain for her a new trial. Mazoltova is serving a life sentence. There is no known limit to Janet's talent. Photography is an art was her frequent subject. Many of her essays have been collected in Diana and the Nikon. But she was also a gifted photographer herself and a collagist. Her delightful burdock consists of 28 photographs of the older, more tattled examples of, the, of this weed that grows at the edges of her Berkshire home. As she explained, in the accompanying essay, she found in them a diversity of stories as complex as those of any human upon whom she cast her eye. She was also a remarkable collagist, her work having been the subject of numerous exhibitions. What was Janet like? 
She and I had been friends for more than half of our lives. Too close friends for me to pretend to be wholly objective. She was beautiful as a young woman, and she never lost her looks. Slight, seemingly fragile, she could also be tough and pugnacious. And she was, of course, ferociously intelligent and kind and warm-hearted, but always asking what is wrong here, what lies behind these appearances, never taking yes as a worthy answer. Over the last few years, Janet would email to me short essays taking as their point of departure family photographs. We called these charming pieces Samizdat, as though they were not destined to be printed and published. There is good news for all of us. We were wrong. The Samizdat, now entitled Still Pictures, will appear in book form in January 23, with an introduction by Ian Fraser and an afterword by Janet's daughter, Anne. Let us rejoice and give thanks to Janet for breaking eternal silence and speaking to us once more. If I have time, I would like to read the poem I mentioned. Thoughts on living in a Shaker house. This Shaker house is neat and low, and everything is made just so. Its lineaments are straight and clean. The household gods are epicene. This house is full of pegs and scents, a kind of grudging elegance informs each piece and artifact come down to us, preserved intact. Chairs and cabinets built for use that never knew a child's abuse, household objects scarcely worn, the makers dead, the heirs unborn. One thinks of busy little souls bent over little wooden bowls like bees in well-conducted hives living their close, peculiar lives, too occupied with sins and chairs for ordinary griefs and cares, too much intent upon a vision to see the saving imprecision. Our rueful sense of lives ill-spent Ill spent, is in the end impertinent and does not in the least impair the beauty of a shaker chair.